My producer, John, and I were just talking about something you all need to hear about. Uh, a long time ago, 2001, wow, uh, Dr. Dave Holland and I started writing this book, The Germ That Causes Cancer, and you see it's a thick book. We uh, took it down to paperback because the people buying it, a little tiny thin book now, you know, it's, uh, it's an overview book, it's 60 pages, and it used to be, you know, a big book. Um, the people reading it, really it was too deep. It is... Uh, it satisfied my thesis. I believe that germs cause cancer, and specifically a germ that would off-gas a poison uh, called a mycotoxin, and that would be uh, fungi, <clears throat> certain fungi. I know so much more 18 years later, 19 years later, because I've worked with so many people who had cancer. These wonderful doctors will, from time to time, uh, got one the other day, call me and say, Doug, I've got a, a child with leukemia. Now, a couple of times this week, I got a text from a dear friend of mine who asked for prayer. Um, seven-year-old, I'm not going to read it to you, um, a seven-year-old little boy who in the summer ran a fever, a high fever, and then he was fine. And then in early January, ran a high fever again. Now, you watching this show as often as you do and learning, absorbing what I try and teach, what would you say? Do you think it's coincidental? The little boy in the summertime out of school would eat a lot of stuff and have a fever and feel bad. And then, and I don't know what diagnostic tests do, and I don't doubt the validity of their diagnosis, leukemia. <clears throat> uh, but now he's been through Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And, and then in January, running a high fever again, goes back to the doctor and Dave told me the other night, the night before last, it's leukemia. The diagnosis is leukemia. This family is falling apart. In this book, the reason I pulled this, John, was in this book on page 47, I believe, well, I wrote a story. I had a radio show before I did TV, so 25 years ago now, I had a radio show that became popular. I'm more of a radio guy because I've got a voice. I remember doing television. So many people would say to me, Doug, you've got, a, you've got a radio presence. On TV, you must not only sound like you know what you're talking about, you have to have that look that you know what you're talking about. The success of the TV show has been a blessing. Um, I don't like, I can't watch myself on TV. I can't watch these. Um, but I do enjoy bringing you information. On the radio show, let's say 23 years ago, I had a call from a woman who opened a health food store. She was an engineer, as I recall. She quit engineering, a six-figure job, to open a health food store. <clears throat> she wanted to do what I did. She wanted to help people get better. She wrote me one day, and the whole text is in this book. By the way, John, I just went to Amazon. Here it is right here. I just went to Amazon. The germ that causes cancer, 25 customer reviews, all fours and fives, um, and it, it'll make you cry. When you put a book out on Amazon, some PhD is going to go in there and rip it apart. Oh, yeah, like a fungus would cause cancer. Folks, if you can find this book, it's a good resource for you. It was Dave Holland and my original manuscript, original work, in the year 2002, maybe. Um, and here's how to differentiate. John, if you can hold, there's a little book, and we still sell the little book for... I don't know, 15, 20 bucks, something like that. Let me show you how to differentiate when you see them online. The little thin book here is, is really a helpful resource. In this, I had a pharmaceutical, uh, 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 oncology pharmaceutical rep. I had an oncology nurse. I had a doctor, microbiologist, and physician, and I wrote in this little book what we believe cancer is. This book satisfied, really, my thesis. I had a hypothesis that uh, fungus caused cancer, and this book is something else. Now, see the difference? Look at the yellow at the very top here. You see the way one has that black writing on it? That black writing says the Fungus Link Series, Volume 1. If you can find it inexpensively, that's the big boy you want. Okay? Um, and I just looked. Here they have one on Amazon. Ooh, $90. Um... And then they have used from $12, $15. But those used are this little one. And uh, still a wealth of information. Let me tell you why I'm bringing all this up. Twice this week, we do not print the big one anymore. 
<clears throat> to be honest with you, John, I had a problem with the binding. It was a thick book, and back, you know, 100 years ago, the binding didn't stay, so some of these pages became weak. I had it to do over again. I do it like our new recipe book. I put it on a ring. Um, this one, if you want the cliff note, that's your guy, the little book. Hey, Linda has cancer. Pray for her and send her this little book. If you really want to delve in to what they were saying hundreds of years ago about cancer, that big boy is your book. If you're hungry that way, if you're a scientist or a very uh, interested person in this whole hypothesis that I think I, I made theoretically correct. So a doctor friend calls me. He's got a young man with leukemia. A friend of mine, Dave, writes me at church. They're praying for this little seven-year-old boy. Folks, so I wrote down, how do we diagnose leukemia? Before I answer your questions today, here are some of, and I knew some of these, uh, anemia, so low uh, red blood count, bloody nose, bloody urine, bloody stool, right? Uh, susceptibility to infection, sore throats, headaches, you know, yada, yada, fever, uh, loss of appetite, loss of weight, therefore, pain in the lower left rib, right? What's here? Your spleen, so it's gonna hurt. This one always blows my mind, an elevated white blood count, swollen lymph nodes, top of the legs, right? Right here, right here, swollen lymph nodes. Okay, so in this first book I wrote on cancer, this woman called me on the air, opened a health food store. Her daughter has a little baby, nine months old, She's crying. I just went off the air, and she, I told the engineer to let me talk to her. She's crying and saying, I can't believe this. I have a grandchild who has leukemia. And so I said, okay, how did they tell? Well, bloody nose, you know? And they do the white blood count, and it's elevated. Folks, what does a blood... You're a smart audience. What does a high white blood count mean? Thank you. Now tell that to oncologists. Uh, the... God made the body to increase leukocytes, white blood cells, um, when there's an infection in the body. Cancer is not an infection. Sporinox helps it get better, and all that does is kill toenail fungus. I could go on and on and on. So this is what I told the doctor, and this is you know, how I'm praying for this family. Uh, let, let, uh, the, uh, let the mind be open, let the words enter, let the knowledge be there for her to understand this. When you see these kids are susceptible to infections, what does a doctor do for an infection? Thank you. Lots of antibiotics. Then they get an elevated white blood count. The way our body's hooked up, our immune system is, we go to war with any organism that's foreign or an artifact that comes into our body. How do we do that? I don't know. God knows, our white blood cell population increases. So for, a, for an oncologist, for a pediatrician, not to see a correlation between, ooh, that's right, I've had that child on seven antibiotics. Antibiotics are known to increase the risk of many types of cancer. And then, ooh, he's got an elevated white blood infection. Doctor, what does that mean? That means he's got an infection. No, no, he has leukemia. She called me crying. <clears throat> And I thought, you know, back in my early days, maybe I was a bit more cocky. But I thought, okay, Doug, this is a home run. Janine, tell me what antibiotic he's been on. Doug, I listen to your show religiously. This child is being raised without antibiotics. Mmm, strike one. Then I thought, okay, um, then... He's probably drinking milk, right? Milk's impregnated with antibiotics. Maybe there's enough antibiotics, not for an adult who's 150 pounds, but a 10-pound but a, a child. Nope, I listened to your show. This child was exclusively breastfed until last month when we started rice milk. Go with me, rice milk. That year, 2000, whenever it was, 1996 or something, we had a horrible drought for the past two years in Texas. Rice is siloed, lots of it, and sometimes rice. This is why it's off my Kaufman One Diet. Rice can sometimes be impregnated with mycotoxin. Strike two, child wasn't drinking milk, he had been breastfed. How cool is that for his immune system? 
um, you know, strike two, he's not drinking milk. He's not taking an antibiotic. Two strikes, one more and I'm out. Rice. Janine, get that child off rice milk now. What do I do in lieu of that, Doug? Goat milk. I'm telling you, it wasn't a week later she called back crying again. That's always bad. When I get a phone call and someone's crying, and she said, uh, thank you. The child's white count stabilized. The bleeding has stopped. It's only been eight days, but everything seems to be going in the right direction. I talked with her once since. Everything was fine. Did this child have leukemia? Yes. All the lab reports said yes. But did this child have leukemia? Or was this child manifesting symptomatology based on poison, mycotoxins from rice, that's a bad one, going in his little tiny body. Okay? Second story. We bought a little fixer-upper. We love Austin, Texas. It reminds us of L.A., where we're originally from. Only it's a microcosm. It isn't spread out over, you know, 6,000 miles like L.A. is. You remember, John. <laughs> Glendora. Oh, yeah. That's where you lived, and we lived in Manhattan Beach, and we never saw each other. You never returned my texts. That was 1970. We didn't have text back then. So anyway, I bought this little fixer home years ago in Austin, Texas. A really cool realtor. We really liked him. He had two little kids. His wife was awesome. And uh, he said, you know, we're thinking about selling our house. It's in the neighborhood you like. Come and look at it. So we went and looked at it, and we loved it. It was different. A lot of windows, kind of mid-century house. Uh, but in the kitchen and in one of the bedrooms, you know, there had been a leak. And so we said, well, I think we like this house a little more. Great, let's make an offer. You know, we ended up with that house. Um, not more than three months later, you know, he was talking to me. And he said, what do you do? Well, I, I think a lot of diseases have a germ involved, and I think fungus is that germ. And he said, oh, that sounds fascinating. We'd have a cup of coffee and, you know, share conversation. <clears throat> three to six months later, he called me and said, I hope you can help me. My son, who I think was 11, has just been diagnosed with leukemia. The bleeding, the white count, the, the lower left rib, the spleen is infused. Infused with what, folks? Um, and I said, okay, now I remember one of the bedrooms. Now, he had a friend he graduated from college with who was an uh, air purification tester. They take that little, like I said the other day, John, <laughs> They go in with that little squeezer thing, and they collect air from the rooms. So I said, well, uh, look, just wait till he gets the results back. Okay, that shouldn't be more than a week. Then he calls me, and I was with somebody. I said, I'll call you right back. Called him right back. You're not going to believe this. The war we have mold in our home, and I wanted to say, yeah, I know. Um, my son's bedroom, he said, if someone's sleeping in that bedroom, get them out immediately. You have a type of mold that is extremely dangerous. Now, that's probably aspergillus mold that is extremely dangerous. Do you think it's coincidental? Um, the family chose to do chemotherapy and all the therapies, and the child's fine. Today he's you know, probably an older teenager, 19, 20 years old, something like that, but he's alive. That will be looked at forever by the halls of pediatric science as a cure for leukemia. When all the while my wife and I think, hmm, what caused it? What would inflame the liver? What makes bread rise? What would elevate a white blood count? There are army. When germs increasingly are in our bloodstream, they go to battle. What would inflame our lymph nodes? Infection. All of the signs of infection and shh, nobody knows it. These are smart people, folks. Before I die, I'm hoping this little child we're now praying for, little seven-year-old boy, um, the, the doctor who called me, his, uh, he's a boy also. I think he's 13 or 14 years old. Leukemia is on a run. Or is it? Leukemia is being diagnosed over and over again based on a nosebleed, blood in the stool, uh, based on, ow, mom, it hurts under my arm. 
uh, based on, ow, it hurts right here too, uh, based on, you know, these symptoms. Are we hyperdiagnosing, like I believe prostate and breast cancer, or are we hyperdiagnosing leukemia? I just want to open with that today, and the, and the story is, you know, in this book is, uh, boy, that was a lot of work. Oh, by the way, John, this was Dave Holland, a wonderful man, a physician. He came over. I made it through the military for six years, a year in Vietnam, without ever having a cup of coffee. I just didn't like coffee. My parents would get up at 2 in the morning, Saturday through Saturday, and put, you know what a percolator is? You young people won't know that, but that's the way they used to make coffee. They'd percolate it. And the whole house would smell like coffee, and I didn't like the smell of it. Dave, we pulled an all-weekender finishing this book, and he came over with this little thing, and it looked like chocolate milk to me. And, you know, there were iced, a little four-banger, you know, and he, I said, what is that, Dave? And he says, something called Starbucks. And I said, what is Starbucks? And he said, it's coffee. These are frappuccinos or something. And I said, I don't like coffee. And uh, he said, you may around midnight tonight. You know, you might want to try one of these. So he was, I remember drinking one thinking, wow, that isn't bad. Real sugary, but it isn't bad. And if it'll help keep me awake, that's good. At 3 in the morning, my juggler's going boom, 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 boom. And we got this book done. <laughs> The next day, we had all the pieces put together. My problem was coming off that stuff. You know, I'm like putting a tourniquet, pulling it around, wanting my wife to inject whatever this stuff is in my arm because it's keeping me awake and my brain was really working. From that point forward, I started drinking, except when I was on the Kaufman One diet, right? The Kaufman One diet says beans are a carbohydrate source and they're a protein source, but too much carbohydrate, maybe, if someone has a yeast or fungal infection. So I put legumes, beans of all kinds, coffee beans, on the back shelf. On the Kaufman Two diet, you can have a cup of coffee, and here I am drinking my mint medley tea, which I just love. Okay, uh, so that's why I want to open today's show. You're an educated audience. I've, you know, I read some of your comments, and it tells me you're an educated audience. You're also hungry for the truth. Every one of you, and I am too, are medical consumers. At some time, I'll be 70 this year, at some time, we're going to go to a doctor's office, we're going to need his wise counsel, and yet when that doctor, I look at it like Felix the cat, the wonderful, wonderful cat, whenever he reaches into his bag of tricks, you know, I look at that very much like medicine today. You're not going to get out of that doctor's office without a prescription or two or more. Put faith in him, probably more. Um, that's what they do. You'd like to think they know the cause of leukemia. You'd like to think that they know ascomycetes grow in a sac in the breast and that they're not all cancer. You'd like to think that. You'd like to think God heated up our body beyond 98.6 degrees for a reason, to burn dangerous organisms. Simultaneous with that, we have the white blood cell population. Science can't figure it out, but for some reason, and it must have been Darwin's cell in the ocean one day, uh, for some reason, um, the white blood cell population increases to phagocytize, to gobble up the debris. So you're running a fever to burn it off, your white blood population is up, you have cancer. Really? Okay, now, to answer some of your questions. Um, John, I don't quite know, this is the show we first saw Mark Sisson on. Mark, Mark is such a cool guy. Uh, Mark and I go back so far. Um, he's such a, uh, you guys, you guys would love the real Mark Sisson. He's such a fascinating guy. Fa I call to congratulate him. Uh, Mark sold Primal Kitchen for $200 million to Kraft uh, here just recently, a couple of months ago. And when I called him, he said, Dougie, and I said, hey, Mark, can I borrow $2 million? And there was like this long pause. He was thinking, uh, does he mean that? Does Doug really want to borrow? <laughs> and he said, then he paused and he said, ah, yeah, pretty good deal, huh? A uh, great deal, and he's very worthy of it. This is a very sharp. He and, and Dave Asprey, um, these guys kind of became my buddies. 
they're very, very smart, very creative, very diligent business people uh, who find something and they really, they really go all in. You can't go into, we were in uh, Natural Grocers in Temple, Texas the other day, and he's got Mark Sisson. He's on the cover of two magazines, and I thought, wow, Ruth and I are high-fiving each other. We remember him before all that, but I'm very, very happy for Mark, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled for him. So, April, thank you for loving him also. We just think the world of him. Okay, so Danny, hey, Doug, I just wanted to tell you, wow, you're the best for sharing and loving us all every week. Peace, brother. Isn't that cool? You remember the old peace sign? Peace. <laughs> Today's generation has just lowered one of the fingers. You know, I mean, peace. Amazing. Okay, uh, MAGA. What is best for systemic yeast infection? <clears throat> systemic yeast infections have plagued hospitals and doctors' offices forever. When you put sick people in a room and you could open the windows and blow <coughs> all of that through the hospital, just like the schoolroom, we didn't have the plagues we have today. When you seal up hospital windows and doors and so forth, and I understand progress, HVAC uh, units like we have up here. When, remember, John, when we put this in, the problem was back so many years ago was putting an air conditioning and heat unit, shh, wouldn't make a sound when it started up. We spent a lot of money for this big contraption we have throughout here. But when we're filming someone in here, we don't want the air conditioning, you know, or the heat to come up. Um, well, systemic mycoses, they're called. Systemic yeast infections. Bloodstream yeast infections are extremely severe. We know that um, hospitalized patients have an increased risk of them. We call these nosocomial infections. Didn't have it when you went in, and now you have it. That's because the air system on in the morgue is the same air system they use in the delivery room, is the same in the recovery room and in intensive care. It just circulates the air. Is that a good idea? I mean, I don't know. Um, but surely, if people are very, very sick and passing these germs around, Pseudomonas, I remember reading an article, burn wards, uh, a bacteria called Pseudomonas, can carry through the ducting systems and so forth. Hospitals, I just, if I'm, a really, really lucky man, I won't spend much time in a hospital. And yet, earlier in my career, I worked in quite a few hospitals. Never seemed to bother me. I was young then. I worry about older doctors, older nurses, older lab techs, you know, uh, uh, x-ray techs, and so forth in hospitals, because the older we get, the more vulnerable we become. Maga, what's the best for a systemic yeast infection? You've got to fool it. Yeast is fungi. Fungi are very old organisms, very old organisms. I think some of the first organisms that were ever here. Um, <clears throat> and, and they were put here as saprophytes. They were put here to gobble up when the leaves fall, <coughs> when the trees fall, uh, when decay happens in forests and on earth. What eats the decay? Fungus. It's a great idea. Um, God made no mistakes, man. But inside your body, which is covered with muscle and then skin, you don't want to have a systemic yeast infection. A localized yeast infection is ringworm, is toenail fungus, is vaginal yeast. A systemic means when it's in your liver and in your kidneys and in your spleen and in your brain, those are pretty dangerous. You have to outsmart fungi. You can't give it a dose of diflucan if it's yeast or uh, if it's aspergillus, a dose of sporinox, and think you've defeated it. It isn't like bacteria. It's been around a long time, and it's smart, and it loves you. This is 70. This is 100. It wants heat. It wants liquid. None of them in here. Lots of it in here. And most importantly, we don't have a food supply here. You do in here. It lives off carbohydrates, and it will thrive the more carbohydrates you give it. So you go on antibiotics, which is a mold, and you begin craving sugars, and thank you, I can see these yeast, the vitreous humor in the eyeball, a liquid in the eyeball is 98.6 degrees, filled with water. I can just envision, uh, John, do you remember the old redwood hot tubs uh, back in the day? I think the eyes are hot tubs, not redwood, but hot tubs for yeast. I think that's why sometimes um, 
you can see the stop sign just fine, and sometimes you're going like this. Who would have thought that glass of wine last night would have done that? Okay, all they want is your food. Systemic yeast infections, I would ask the doctor for um, uh, Nizoral for a week, then Spornox for a week, then Diflucan for a week, all the while on the drug Nystatin, which is a gut antifungal. From the gut, we're now learning, right? Remember the, did any of you pat me on the back? Did you see the study two weeks ago? All these doctors, Mark Underwood from Prevagen sent it to me, but I think Mark Sisson sent it to me too. Everybody was sending me this article that said in mice studies, they found that gut yeast breach the blood-brain barrier and can induce memory loss. Thank you, thank you, thank you. They're so close, it'll only take them another 100 years. Do you have that time to hope they learn this? Um, so what's the best for a systemic yeast infection? Starve it, cough on one diet, and then I'd rotate antifungals every week or two. And that should get it done, right? Within a couple of months, you should feel much better. Uh, Junae, thank you. Hi, Doug. I'm grateful to listen to you. It is my honor. Thank you, Junae. I was wondering if you could give me some more information on MS. I just received uh, this December 14th, information on this, or this diagnosis. Um, in the year, boy, Dave Holland was so influential in my life. Such a good writer, such a good man. Um, in the year, I first met Joe Mercola, 2000, 1999, 2000. Uh, he came to the studio out in Fort Worth where I was filming. He wanted to be on my show. He was kind of a brand new guy at that time. And he wrote me an email, uh, no, would have been a letter. I don't think I had email back then, that I was responsible for building his Mercola.com. I didn't see him then for a long period of time. And now we lecture at some of the same events and we, he's a really neat guy. Um, Joe Mercola published an article. Any of you can get it. You can go to my website and just type in the search engine up there uh, and type in uh, multiple sclerosis, chronic mycotoxicosis. Easy, right? M-Y-C-O, mycotoxicosis, T-O-X-I-C-osis. Uh, um, I believe that most autoimmune diseases are chronic mycotoxicoses. We published on his website in <clears throat> 15 years ago, and we provided evidence, scientific evidence, that existed back then. There's much more now. <clears throat> but we provided uh, very valid evidence that MS was a chronic mycotoxicosis. Can this same yeast that inflames our body that mimics serious disease. Do you think it can eat, shoe a th eat through a thin coat of myelin that covers our nerves? Sure it can. You know, let's not be foolish. Of course it can, and it does. I want to tell you, though, John, do you happen to have uh, Pam Bartha's card? Ooh, I just, is this one I hope? Yes. Anybody. Uh, Pam wrote a book. If we can shoot that up, Johnny. Pam wrote a book, she's a friend of mine, Become a Wellness Champion by Pam Bartha. There she is, very sweet. She's got this gorgeous family, but she was told, uh, John, at 23, 24 years old, you have MS. You're gonna be in a wheelchair, say goodbye to your kids, your life is gone. Pam is one of the best fighters I've ever seen in my life. She's gonna be on TV again, she's coming out here. I wanna give you a phone number. If I had MS or a chronic immune disease that wasn't getting better, this woman I would go to. And you don't need to go to her. You need to heed her advice. It's antifungal advice. You know, it's funny. She was going this direction. I was going this direction. And we met, I don't know, a dozen years ago or so. And I realized, like I do with many things, look, the American Heart Association says, um, eat a lot of greens. American Cancer say eat fruits and vegetables. They don't know why, but it seems that when people eat that way, they don't get much cancer. Antifungal, antifungal, antifungal. Grapefruit, antifungal. You know. So let me give you Pam's number. Uh, let's see who is this? Uh, Janae, Pam Barth. I don't think. I hope this isn't her cell number. <laughs> if it is, 
Pam, forgive me. Okay, it's, oh, it might be. Ah, 778-755-6559. This is proof that Anne's eyes work. This must be font one. But her phone number, cell or otherwise, is 778 area, 755-6559. I got to have lunch with her and dinner with her uh, with uh, this other great doctor we met out in Orlando. And I couldn't get enough of talking what she's doing with these people. She and I are on the same page. And I'm telling you, she is helping. She was given up on at age 23. Here it is, you know, 40, 50 years later. Pam is fine, jogs. She didn't have what was diagnosed. Was it accurately diagnosed? Doesn't matter. Yesterday I said there's no police because there's no one that knows medicine. And if we continue to eliminate fungus and mycotoxins from our medical training, we'll never know the answer to everything. Here's the good news. Bad for us, great for drug companies. Oh yeah, our blood thinner works much better. Oh yeah, ours is cheaper. Oh yeah, what made your blood so thick? Why are you having a stroke? We don't have to ask that, as long as drug companies are there to develop new drugs. Okay, you kind of see where I'm coming from. Get the book, Become a Wellness Champion by Pam Bartha. I would recommend you start with that and then call her cell phone and uh, tell her Doug sent you. And by the way, folks, money doesn't change hands at all. I don't even know what she charges, but the dramatic results Pam is getting after six weeks with people is amazing. I, I'd even see her if I had a, any serious problem. Uh, did, did Doug address asthma yet? Somebody yesterday, I promised I would talk about this. Oh, this is good. Thank you, Danica. Man, you guys, okay. Somebody, 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 somebody you see. Then he picked out two somebody, Sally and me. Remember that? The cat in the hat. Oh, I was going to read that. I'll read it tomorrow for you guys. Uh, Dr. Seuss book about pills, pills, pills. Somebody asked me their daughter had asthma. Uh, ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -la. Ah, here it is, Eileen. Is that who's asking now? Eileen. Okay, good. Thank you, Eileen. Um, she wants to know about, uh, oh man, that's sad. Little girl. And by the way, her asthma, Eileen, your, your granddaughter's asthma, uh, initiates when playing sports. What little girl, what little boy doesn't play sports, right? And so it's so unfortunate that so often as these kids begin to play sports, <laughs> I have to stop, I have to take a breather. All they're doing is bringing up fungus, I believe, from their lungs. Normally we do this, but in sports you do this. <sighs> and so that which is lie dormant or lay dormant for years can become activated. No shortage of emergency rooms that are going to treat her with isoprel or epinephrine or something, and that's good. Huge shortage of emergency rooms and pediatricians that understand the fungus link to asthma. It's real. Asthma is very much like chronic sinusitis. In 1998, 100% of patients who went in for chronic sinusitis got an antibiotic. Then in 1999, the Mayo Clinic said, uh-oh, all. 96% of chronic sinusitis patients, thank you, sir, chronic sinusitis patients uh, have chronic fungal conditions. Sinusitis have fungus, not bacteria. Oops, the medical community said in 1999, thank God for the Mayo Clinic, we're going to start giving all of these patients antifungals wrong. Not a one of them does. There may be one or two isolated, really brilliant. Well, Dr. Uh, who is our friend? Dr. Don Dennis in Atlanta, Georgia. He knows this. He's an ear, nose, and throat guy, um, and he treats all the patients for fungus, and he's right. For every one Don Dennis, there are 5,000 ear, nose, and throat doctors. Oh, take another antibiotic. If you're that smart, don't you want to excel? Don't you want to walk out on the limb a little bit? Don't you want to ask your patients, would you mind if I experimented with you? We're telling all cancer patients, you got to enter this drug experimental 
but why don't you tell a chronic sinusitis? Why don't you tell an asthma patient? Um, if I had asthma and it had started in the house she's in, I would put in her bedroom a Petri dish, follow directions, leave it there, then put the lid on it and be good science experiment for her too. Watch the fuzz that grows out on it, okay? When the fuzz begins growing on it, you'll understand the etiology of her problem. Send it to a lab and they can isolate which fungi it is, what fungus it is, uh, and can tell you how many CFUs, colony forming units, there are in that. Um, now, there are what we used to call IPPB, intermittent positive pressure breathing treatments um, that can help. I, I like oregano. It's not scientific. Isopril and other uh, vasodilators are used in the case of asthma. Um, if this is treated like a disease, then it is one. If it's treated like her lungs were a harbor for mold because she was living in it for many years, let's get it out. Talk to the doctor about, in a young child who loves sports, maybe nice statin. They say only 3% of nice statin becomes visceral. That means 97% stays in the gut. We all have gut leakage, right? So about 3% of it becomes visceral. I like those numbers for a young girl who loves sports. What do, what do sports enthusiasts and coaches tell young girls and young boys who love sports? Eat carbs, haha. <laughs> Load up on those carbs because that converts to sugar and you can really be careful. Uh, try and follow the Kaufman diet, maybe get some nice statin. If not nice statin, I would use resveratrol. I would use caprylic acid, rotate them every couple of weeks. And I would see if in a month following my diet, um, she isn't much better. Now she can exercise. And mom, it's only, it's only a five now. It's not a 10 anymore. More of the same, Eileen, should help her. These fungi don't want to leave the human body moist, warm, and we feed it. Okay? Hope that helps. I see Eileen in here all the time. What a sweet woman she is. Um, okay, so Joyce, this is such a good question. Thank you for asking it. In the new woman's book, I'm telling you, I think we have a bestseller here. But I touch on some issues, guys, we need to talk about more and more. I wish our gynecologists, you know, would talk about these things. Um, if you blow a balloon up, it becomes kind of cool. Did you ever do that and you rub your hair on it, electrostatic, and you stick it on the wall and the balloon stays there? It's kind of fun. We used to make weird noises, you know, and then you'd let it go and it zooms around the room. Imagine that's your bladder, okay? At some point, the balloon's gonna get so hard, one more puff of air and it's gonna pop. That's where many women's and many men's bladders are today. I saw an article that said, by the time a woman is 65, 60 or 65 years young, 50% um, of them have bladder incontinence. So let's go here. Um, John, would you do me a favor? Would you, you remember yesterday, for the benefit of the folks who didn't see yesterday, could you put what you enjoy put together? Uh, could you let the folks see that one more time today? I want you to think, this is my bladder. They set this in an oven. This is buns, you know, yeast, bread. And watch that slowly. I won't talk. What was the period of time there, John? It was uh, two hours. Two hours in a 98 or in a 70 degree home. Uh, putting in the oven like that, maybe 80 degrees. They didn't have the oven on. As long as there's yeast in that bladder, slowly, slowly, the bladder doesn't pop. The lungs, Eileen, won't pop with asthma. I guess they could if it's bad enough. Thank God they don't. They're resilient, right? It's the way God made the equipment. Um, but the bladder is going to get larger and larger and larger and leak through the urethra. This is not uncommon. It kind of blew my mind to see this is not uncommon. Um, 
So here's what I do. Honestly, folks, this is what I do. Talk to a doctor about a yeast infection you may have in the bladder. It doesn't take a genius to figure out how a woman anatomically enjoying a loving relationship with her male counterpart, if the male counterpart, there was another study today about these dermatophytes that live on the skin being transmittable. Um, anatomically, a woman is exposed urethrally to yeast, right? Um, and if it is yeast in there, d have you ever heard of Diflucan? It was a drug that came out in the, it's called uh, fluconazole, it came out in the 1980s as a treatment for AIDS. And it really helped men and women with AIDS, right? But then it became, in the 1990s, the one pill vaginal yeast cure. Well, you may not have vaginal yeast, you may have bladder yeast. Why couldn't a pill or two or three, 150 milligram of Diflucan, why couldn't you try 150 milligrams every other day for three pills, follow my diet, and see if voila. Now, I don't think in a severe, in, an, in a daily incontinent problem, or sneezing or coughing, et cetera, and a little leakage, I don't think one or two or three pills is gonna cure it. But at least we found its etiology, at least we found its cause. If in fact, you're coming back in next week and saying, hey Doug, this is your friend Joyce again, you're not gonna believe this no bladder leakage for a, a week. What does that mean? Where it was leaking three times a week. It means she's found the cause. It was yeast. Yeast makes bread rise, why not bladders? Okay, and remember, that oven was 80 degrees. Your bladder is 98.6 degrees. So it's gonna be slow over a long period of time. Think that way, think that way. Thank you, Joyce, great question. Okay, so we'll get down here. Okay, we answered these, good. Okay, Doug, uh, this is Eddie. I wonder if Eddie has ever seen, E-T-T-I, cute spelling of that, has ever seen the Townsend Letter. The Townsend Letter for Doctors Communicating with Doctors came out in the 1970s or 80s. It is a glorious manuscript um, of doctors communing nutritional, uh, communicating with each other, it was. Now it's the Townsend Letter for Doctors and Patients. Um, uh, her last name just reminded me of that. Do I think fibromyalgia is caused by fungus? No, I don't. I know it is. Because I was able to work, not in every case. I don't think every case of cancer is fungus. Um, nor do I think every case of fibromyalgia. But what, Eddie, what do we have to lose? Man, you've got the Kaufman diet. You can talk to your doctor. This is what we used to do at the hospital. with patients, the doctor's patients with fibromyalgia. Put them on Diflucan and Nystatin for a month while they're following the Kaufman diet. Voila. You're gonna know in, you're gonna know in 10 days, but the doctor is gonna know in one month. Doctor, I'll come back in one month. Help me with this, please. Um, well, Diflucan is for vaginal yeast. This isn't a vaginal problem. Why is it that the doctor can't understand? They have an elbow and a shoulder too. It doesn't just kill yeast in the vagina. It can kill it anywhere that is open to the bloodstream. So fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, oral thrush, um, diabetes, pancreatic problems, spleen problems, kidney problems, lumps on you. Why doesn't a doctor know? This thing doesn't fall to the vagina. This goes to the bloodstream. Ask the doctor if you can get for a month some hundred, I, we used to use 200 milligram Diflucan. Never once did we see an elevated liver enzyme. For more information, just go to my website at the very top on the right, uh, Eddie. We have a letter, a fungal protocol that you can take to your doctor. Just print that out, it's two pages. Take it to him and say, Doc, I've been coming to you for a while with fibromyalgia. I wanna try Kaufman's diet. I wanna try, uh, there it is, thank you, John. Pain is not a lifestyle, it's a great ad. Uh, protocol, doctors, fungus, pro fungal protocol. Because doctors really, God bless them folks, they really, uh, not many of them know how to write prescriptions for antifungals because what they learn in medical schools, 
right? Lots of prescriptions for antibiotics. Little did we know the snap. Little did we know the snap. I was putting a table that I was moving from one office to the other in the back of my pickup truck, and what are those bungee cords? So I tied it in my, and when I was getting the table out, I pulled it back, and man, that thing shot across the parking lot. It must have gone 100 feet. That's the snap we're seeing with antibiotics now. That's the snap we have overused to the point, I'm gonna say it, our doctors today are guilty of abusing antibiotics. God bless them. It's what they learned in their medical training, and if they veer from that, they can lose their license. And who do you think trained doctors? Okay, now, I'll get off that high horse. Uh, ta -ta. Okay, Maria says, I've been doing the Kaufman diet for 16 days now, good. Lost eight pounds so far, and a lot of fat inflammation around the belly and gut. However, my finger joints are still swollen. Fingers are fat every morning when I wake up. How can I get rid of the swollen finger joints? Okay, I work at a desk job, um, and I tell how swollen my joints are, I get by how hard it is to take my wedding ring off. Okay, my RA wants to put me on RA. What's an RA? My rheumatoid arthritis, I thought it was. My wants to put me back on Plaquenil, my doctor, I guess. I want to put me back on Plaquenil, but I don't want to do that. I've been taking olive leaf extract, vitamin D3, oregano, listen to Maria, apple cider vinegar, and chlorella for liver detox. Okay, the journey of a thousand miles begins with what? 16 days. Maria, there's no panacea in the world of fungus. Why? I think I've taught everybody this before. Human cells and fungal cells are so similar, we call them eukaryotes. Now, bacteria and other organisms are called prokaryotes. I'll tell you what a eukaryote, E-U-K, if you want to look it up, eukaryote. Eukaryote has a cell membrane that keeps all the stuff, the cytoplasm, together. Further, it has a nucleus in the middle or somewhere within that cytoplasm, and in that nucleus is DNA. Fungus? and human cells both have cell walls and nuclear DNA? Hey Doug, wouldn't it be weird if they got together and some of the DNA from fungus was shared with the DNA from humans? Welcome to my world. Now John, if you'll do me one more favor and just shoot back on this book. Oh, I wish you could see it. Can I... Um, I guess we can't get that close. Okay, let me just share with you what this is. Over here, I'll put it back, Johnny. Over here, I have the word fungal DNA. Over here, I have the word human DNA. On the cover of the book right here, I have hybrid DNA. I think with certainty, and I quote a few doctors who believe that also, the DNA from human cells converge, mix with DNA from fungal cells and begin growing in a sac. Um, you know, I just, I just need you guys to know that to kill that sac sometimes is impossible. I think we've helped many people with cancer, but the lump stays there. Oh, it gets lower through the years. My point is, Maria, ask your doctor if you can have some Diflucan. Uh, get on something called uh, oh, what would I do? A good anti-inflammatory. There are so many. Uh, here, you know, I talk about this guy all the time. Uh, curcumin, this is a great product made by Optavita. Uh, curcumin, anti-inflammatories, Diflucan for a couple of weeks. Now that should take the swelling down in the fingers. The journey of a thousand miles doesn't quit at 16 days. You had some health problems? I'm so glad in two weeks they're getting better. Um, good for you, Maria. You made that commitment the first of the year and you're sticking with it. The swollen hands will eventually turn around too. Right now, the fungus in them is saying, no, don't kill me here. Diflucan can do that. Okay, I'd give that a couple week experimental try. Uh, okay, uh, Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. Good morning, Doug. My 22-year-old son found a mass on his thyroid at 17 years old. EMT wants to do a biopsy on him. I said no. His dad says yes. <laughs> Man, put me in the middle of that one. Um, okay. Found a mass five years ago in his thyroid. Um, 
and obviously the doctor wants to do a biopsy. Okay, let's walk down that aisle. Let's say they do a biopsy on this, they take a punch biopsy here, um, and they say, wow, this is cancer. Lorraine, what would you do? Um, your husband would probably, and he, the son, and certainly the EMT would say, we gotta start radiation on that thyroid. Um, I want you to play this out as though the worst case scenario exists. Wow, he's got thyroid cancer. How'd he get it? You know his background, you raised him, how cool is that? That's right, he slept in a basement in Ohio for six years of his life. Basements are built underground. Think they got mold problems? Yeah. Um, it, that's right. When he was a little boy, he always had inner ear and tonsil, and so we put him, as a matter of fact, we had his tonsils taken off. He had a lot of infections. What do a lot of infections mean to an EMT? Lots of prescriptions. So, and now, you guys, I'm gonna say it, Lorraine, because I like you, I see you in here often. Doug Kaufman, at 22, probably consumed more alcohol <laughs> than any of my friends. Look, I think I had an excuse. I think I came home with post-traumatic stress. I think I saw things a 20-year-old kid in Vietnam shouldn't have seen, and I hit it. I hit it with alcohol. And then I met a girl years later, and she said, I really like you, but I don't like what you become when you drink. And you guys try and get together with your football buddies in Los Angeles without drinking. I tried it. It's the worst. We used to have the L.A. Rams. I understand the Rams are now back in L.A. How great is that? I don't follow football anymore. Is that the oblong one they bend over and push through their legs? Yeah. Um, understand, he's probably drinking. And so the yeast can make this little nodule begin to grow. The EMT is not going to say that because the EMT goes home and drinks. They're not going to see the correlation there. But mom can and dad can. As a family, you guys need to think this out. Now, is it dangerous to have a punch biopsy or a needle biopsy on a thyroid? I don't think so. The one thing that's always concerned me on a solid mass is the liberation of spores in this mass, if they are spores, if they're, if Doug's hypothesis, you know, if Doug's hypothesis is correct, then these will be fungal spores. Um, I wouldn't worry so much on thyroid as I would in a prostate. I think often they're fungal spores. In a uh, breast, I think often they're fungal spores. If, if dad and the EMT win, then play that out. The best case scenario is, oh, it was, uh, it was nothing. It was a little fatty globule. Whew. Thank you. If it's the worst case scenario on cancer, then what does dad say? I know what the EMT will say. What does dad say? What do we do for this, okay? Play it out. A biopsy isn't the worst thing that can happen to this young man. But I'd ask him, can you just share with me, son, because you don't live here anymore. Do you drink alcohol? Of course, you know what? My mom, Alice, probably did ask me that. I probably went over to their home a few weekends. <laughs> And they smelled it on me. Um, and I probably would have denied it. I, back then, I probably would have said, no, you know, I'm like anybody else. I have a beer now and again. A beer would have been the operative word. I hated the taste of it. Hate the taste of it if I smell it to this day. But it did put out the fire. Um, Man, Tim. Tim is such a good guy. NBC just ran a story how it, it turns out that 30 million Americans are not allergic to penicillin. <laughs> Cough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tim, your mom was such a cool person. Um, 30 million Americans are not allergic. Do you want to know what I think, Tim? And uh, Tim knows this. Tim knows me. We're all allergic to penicillin. Look, Rather than get a penicillin shot in the hip, I would, if I went to doctors, probably say I'm allergic to penicillin, hoping they'll give me tetracycline or erythromycin or something else, right? Because um, I just don't do shots. I could never be a junkie. That's why I drank. <laughs> could never shoot it into myself. Um, I think when most of you think you're allergic to medicine, one of the common indoor molds is called penicillium. It's what was, you know... So it was founded in 1928. Um, it became a drug called penicillin. 
So the mold is penicillin. The poison it ma mold is penicillium. The poison it makes is called penicillin. It kills tiny organisms in tiny doses. God forbid we start throwing antibiotics into kids and adults as though that's normal. We are. But penicillium, I think many of us are up to here with mold. One more pellet of mold and it pushes us over that threshold and our tongue can swell and we can die. Mold kills, mold's known to cause. Uh, 1.5 million deaths a year. Um, I think that's so wrong. I think mold kills millions and millions. Oh, the death certificate says cancer. The death certificate says atherosclerosis. The death certificate says asthma. What caused those diseases? That's when we'll get smart in America. Thanks, Tim. I always, I always love hearing from you. Um, yeah, so Danica, great question. Can you please tell me what can be done for Candida glabrata, uh, urinary tract infections? Um, Diflucan or voriconazole, I haven't spoken about that one much, but this is a, a newer generation systemic antimicrobial. Urinary tract infection, glabrata, uh, tropicalis, albicans, there's 70 species of Candida. They respond favorably to voriconazole and diflucan. But I wouldn't just take diflucan, and I wouldn't just ask my doc for a script of voriconazole. I would ask for three diflucan and three for a voriconazole, V-O-R-A, voriconazole. And I would starve it. And I would see to it, Danica, um, that for a period of time, you prevent skin fungi, if they exist, from being passed into that area of your body. So for a couple of weeks, you use a barrier, okay? And I'd go on the diet to starve them, and I'd use a diflucan for three days, then voriconazole for three days, if your doctor agrees. Um, but I think very quickly, you're gonna know in a week if this is a, the deal. Glabrata, a little bit more difficult to eradicate than albicans. Um, oh, here's Jill's question again. So here's Anne, gosh, you guys, skin tags, tinnitus, driving me nuts. Did you see people are putting a clothespin, John, on the affected ear? Have you read about that? People with tinnitus, not so much vertigo, but humming, buzzing noise in one ear, are putting a clothespin on their ear, you know, for a few minutes at night before they go to bed, and that's helping them. So what they're doing is interrupting or breaking the nerve impulse. Um, what do we know kills nerves? Mycotoxins. So when I see tinnitus or, or even vertigo, I always think those things. Joni, one thing you might try is a virgin cold press olive oil, four or five drops in the ear while you're watching TV at night or reading at night. Uh, that might really help. And then, and finally, I was thin my whole life, couldn't even gain weight. The last time I had any antibiotics was before I had children. So over 25 years ago. Now the past five years, she's, this is so good. No matter what I try, it's in the adipose around my middle. I can't shake it. Do you think that's connected to mycotoxins? Maybe fungus. I really focused on no sugar, limited carbs for two to three years, and the weight still comes on. Just can't explain the weight gain. And the one thing I have found universally, when I worked with sick people, we could help them get better, but when you hit a point where your hormones tend to shut off that regulate uh, body growth, then especially women begin having weight problems. John, can you show that? Uh, uh, my brother-in-law said it looks like I'm in prison. Can you show what I do four or five days a week again? I want to exit with you watching this and I'll see you guys tomorrow at 3 p.m. That's a little $190 machine. <laughs> John said it looks like I'm in jail. Uh, that you do, I do it 10, 15 minutes a day. Join me tomorrow at 3 p.m. You've got to start exercising and you've got to commit to it, Ann. Um, God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me today. I'll be back with you tomorrow at 3 Central Time. Tell a friend. See you then.